Well, we continue this morning in Ephesians chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn over there. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 4. And we're continuing our series this morning um, called What We Do. And it would be remiss, especially today, I think, not to remind us, as we have kind of every week, that it's built completely on who we are in Christ. As we come to know the Lord and he transforms us to be more like Jesus, creates a new life within us, essentially through his spirit, then we're empowered to live out this life in him. And so this is really important, especially for us today. It's for all of this series, but to understand who we are determines absolutely what we do and how we live out this life. And this morning, we kind of are in this second part of what we last week called We Love Home. So what do we do in Christ? We love at home. We love in terms of last week our husbands and wives and those relationships. And scripture gives us such clarity in how we relate to one another, how we love one another in God's design and his ways, which produces abundant life for us now. Right? But then the second piece of that that we get to talk about today are children and parents, right? So the household code kind of continues. This is part two. We love at home. So how do we live this out as children and as parents? So that being said, would you stand with me if you're physically able in honor of reading God's word, Ephesians chapter six, verses one through four. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Father, would you apply these words to our heart? God, would you give us ears to hear and eyes to see the things you want to show us and teach us this morning through your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. So we love at home. Our relationship now we begin to press into because the scripture does is how do we relate as kids and as parents? And so the first part of this, we're going to look at kids. And I realize not all of our kids are in the room, so parents, you can just re-preach this to them when you're at home with them later. Uh, But for those that are, here we go. And for all of us, really, I think there's a lot of application that makes sense no matter where we are in our context. And then we're going to get to parents and grandparents and all that as we go through. So it begins very simply, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Children, obey your parents. And I'm going to, I'm going to look to the right a lot, so you guys just get used to it. Over. I'm just kidding. So children, obey your parents. So the first part of this, I would say before we even really dive into what that means and what that looks like is the reality that for kids to obey their parents, if you're a follower of Jesus, the greatest thing you do to help you in that cause is to literally abide with Jesus. It's the same for parents, right? For us to lead you in a way that's right and godly, we need to be walking with Jesus for you to follow in your parents as they teach and and lead you in a way that's right, that you would be spending time with Jesus. The greatest thing we can impart to our kids is how to walk with Jesus. And it's often one of the things we leave out is here's how you begin to study the Bible. Here's how you begin to pray. Here's how you walk with him. Because as wise as we may ever become as parents in this world or as grandparents, the great nuggets of wisdom that flow from our mouths no, no jest intended over here. They will not change the hearts of our kids. It's the Holy Spirit who changes their hearts and lives. And so we need to be taking them to Jesus first and foremost. And so that abiding is critical. And literally that abiding what leads what scripture says to transformation. So kids, when your parents tell you things, here's how God uses that. When they're, you're called to obey them, even when it doesn't make sense, here's what the scripture says, Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And for those who are called, and they're called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Part of the reason God calls us to be obedient to our parents is to be conformed to the image of Jesus and the recognition that when we obey, he is transforming us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And here's the beautiful picture of this, that when we follow in an obedience to our parents, 
It's modeling for us the rest of our lives and how we would follow and be obedient to Christ and our heavenly Father. That's the design of that. That obedience translates into then how we would be obedient. And often that picture of our parents, especially our dad, becomes the picture we have. And our perfect heavenly Father has called us to follow him for our good and for his glory. And so we're obedient to our parents in that. So understanding we're being conformed, that transformation. Then it says this right after that, obey your parents in the Lord. And so that means two things, really. One, it means we talked about this last week in that relationship between a husband and a wife and that crazy word submission that we talked all through, that there's a reality that there is nothing that we should be asked to do that would be contrary to God's word. So obeying your parents doesn't mean obeying them when they ask you to sin against God. But in all other circumstances, we would obey our parents in everything. The second thing that means in the Lord is this, that when you do this, it is as worship to the Lord. Colossians 3, 17, it says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him, which means when you obey, you're literally worshiping God and honoring him in that because it's what he's called us to do. So the next little part of that says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Enough said. It doesn't say this. Obey your parents when you think they are right. Right? Because that would get fewer and fewer times. It doesn't say obey your parents when all your friends are doing the same thing. Right? And it also doesn't say obey your parents when all your friends' parents are parenting your friends the same way. And what I mean by that is, well, everyone else has the new iPhone 10 or X, whatever you want to call it, in the fourth grade. Why can't I? Right? Everyone else is doing this and has all the social media accounts and has everything set up perfectly. Their parents must love them and you must not love me. That's not what it says. It says, obey them for this is right, which would say this. Your parents have been uniquely gifted to raise you. They know you and love you, and the decisions that they make, whether you understand it or agree with it, are for your good. So honor them in it. Obey your parents, for this is right. And then it goes in quoting really what is the fifth commandment that's given way back in Exodus. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. And it follows with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And again, in Deuteronomy 5, 16, when Moses is telling the people of Israel before he passes on, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you that your days may be long and that that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And so there's two prongs of this promise that is given to those who would honor their father and their mother. By the way, this is honoring your father and mother for the rest of our lives, not just when we're at home under their care, but for the rest of it. And so the promise is this, it's twofold. The first, that it may go well with you, right? That there are good things that follow when we honor our father and our mother. Out of Proverbs 1, 8 and 9, it says this, hear my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head, and pendants for your neck. Now, understanding that in our culture, especially if you're talking to a guy, it's like if you honor your father and your mother, we'll give you this really beautiful garland to wear on your head. They're like, hey, I'm good, thanks. Right? No more pendants around my neck either. So what's the context of that? Culturally, uh, there's really going back to uh, the Middle Eastern times, even before that, to Egyptian time, as to this garland that would be placed on someone's head. And the garland symbolized a life of wisdom. It symbolized a life of honor. Somebody who had lived in such a way that there was uh, glory brought to their family name, honor brought to it, because they lived in wisdom. And it would only be bestowed upon you at your death. That's encouraging. Right, you're finally, you get this wreath and it's put upon you in your death. That was the Egyptian culture that they would have seen and understood very clearly. And then a pendant that would have been around your neck, not going too deep into it, but would have symbolized that you are a person who's walking with wisdom, that you're a person who's living your life in such a way that, again, brings honor to your name, that brings honor to your family, that brings honor in that way. And so when Solomon writes this to the people, 
and to the sons and daughters and saying, honor your parents and live, in, excuse me, in Proverbs 1, he's saying you'll have this garland. He's saying you'll have wisdom even before your death. It's as though you will have lived a life because you are taking the wisdom of others and applying it. You bring honor and it goes well with you in life because you understand you don't know everything. And it's good to have those who are on your behalf guiding you along the way. Another proverb that's really helpful for this, Proverbs 6, it says, My son, again, keep your father's commandment. Forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. And listen to this. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Even in discipline, even when it turns south and you don't like where it's going, in discipline, that you would honor your father and your mother because in discipline is the way of life when it doesn't make sense. That it may go well with you. Not only that, well, let me say this real quick. Here's a challenge. Last week, we gave a couple of challenges to husbands and wives. So kids, here's the challenge for you. Colossians 3.17, or I'm sorry, Colossians 3.20 says this, children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. So here's how I would translate that for us. Okay, no more eye rolls. We'll say that again. No more eye rolls, right? Obey them first time all the way with a thankful heart. If you want to see your home transformed and your relationship with your parents transformed, obey them the very first time they ask. Do whatever they've asked to its completion and do it with a thankful heart. And I guarantee if you try it for a week, not just once, right? Try it for a week and it will literally transform your relationship with your parents because God's called us to honor our parents in that way. So the first promise that it may go well with you. The second is that you may live long in the land. And we could understand that quite literally, they won't kill you. <laughs> right? No, it, it really doesn't mean they won't kill you. But, yeah, there's a part of that. So, <laughs> that you may live long in the land. So for us to understand that, we have to understand the nation of Israel and the reality of this, this kind of intertwining understanding of the land with God's promises to them. So God promised this land of Canaan, and it was very much a part of their identity, who they were. Going back to Abraham and the founding of a people, he said, I'll give you this nation. And hundreds of years later, he does give them that nation. They walk in and they take the land, which is God's promise and his blessing. And so when we understand that you'll live long in the land, what that means is that there will be blessing and honor from God, not necessarily long length of days, which that may be part of it, but there will be blessing and honor from the Lord on your life because you choose to follow in his ways. And we see it lived out from Israel in their own story, right? How many times were they disobedient and God takes them even from the land and kicks them out so that they would come back into a relationship with him in that restoration. But when they were in be obedient to him, you watch this flourishing of Israel, this flourishing of a nation, this flourishing of life, this abundance because God is honored in that, and he wants to honor his kids and bless them when they're obedient and walking in the way in which they should go. So that you may live long in the land and truly find what would be abundant life. And before we move on to the next part of this, I think it's worth saying that there is an aspect of this that I think speaks to what we might call aging parents in our culture. Aging parents, because some of you have found yourselves or will find yourselves at some point in what's called kind of the sandwich, right? There's even a generation now, the boomers, called the sandwich generation in some cases because you're not only taking care of kids who are coming up, but you're taking care of parents. There is an honoring that is so good when we honor our parents in that way, and it is a blessing that God sees and rewards in our lives. And I don't want to mention that because what, what I've witnessed in the year that we've been here is some of you, a lot of you, are incredible at this. That you are loving aging parents in a beautiful way. And it's worth noting because some of the hardest times when you feel so frustrated and ready to give up, 
the Lord is there and he's seeing all of those sacrifices and he's seeing all of those moments in obscurity that no one else is seeing and he smiles on it because you're honoring him in the midst of honoring those parents. So can I just tell you, keep it up. And for the rest of us, we're watching that example and for me personally, so thankful because I get to see what it looks like when you're honoring your parents that one day when we'll get there and get to do that same thing. And it's hard, but keep after it because it is a blessing to the Lord. And by the way, that is also a picture that is so anti-cultural because we worship youth. We worship the new, right? We, we do so many things to even look younger and stay younger and all of that. And so to honor that generation when it's not pretty always and when it's not easy that is a testimony of the goodness of God to our culture and that we would honor in that way. It's good. Honor your father and your mother for this is a commandment and the promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So the second piece of this then from children really moving into parents and says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And we'll get to that specific father part in a minute. It's important for us to get there, but I think we can extrapolate this fairly to say this is also to moms, right? It's also to parents. We see it in the scriptures. Moms and dads both have this critical role of instructing and disciplining their kids in a way that is right before God. They both have that responsibility. We saw it in Proverbs in the two passages we just read. Uh, you see it even in places like Song of Solomon in chapter 8, verse 2, where he talks about the incredible impact King Solomon that his mom had on his life pouring into him. Uh, we see it in other situations with uh, especially Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 5, where literally Paul is writing to him and saying, the faith that was once in your grandmother and then in your mother has been passed down to you. And so that important legacy that has been led in Timothy's life, who's pastoring the church at Ephesus, the one we're reading about, right, because of the legacy of faith being passed down from his grandma to his mom and now to Timothy. And so this is to really to both, both parents for sure. And here's what the scripture begins, I think, as we understand what it begins to talk about there. It's fathers do not provoke your anger, but bring them up. So how do we begin to raise or parent our kids? And I want to say that intentionally. We, as followers of Christ, raise our kids. We don't outsource it. According to the scripture, we raise them. We don't leave it up to the public school system. We don't leave it up to the church. We don't leave it up to any other social entity. We are the ones who own the raising of our kids, parenting them in the way that is right before the Lord. And that demands, first and foremost, that we are abiding with Jesus. Because in all honesty, we can't display the fruits of the Spirit all the time if we're not walking with Jesus. Right? How many times do we get to the end of the day or maybe it's the beginning of the middle of the day right? or however long it is that you've spent that much time and all of a sudden you're going, I can't take it anymore. And for me to display love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, it absolutely means that I have walked with Jesus that day before I've walked with my kids. And then you have strength to live that out with them. So if we want that fruit of the Spirit flowing through our veins, it demands that we're spending time in God's Word, we're spending time in prayer, praying for our kids, right? Praying for the day that's ahead of them, praying for whatever challenges to be able to embrace those things in the fruit of the Spirit instead of in the flesh. So first of all, we understand that we've got to abide. The second thing is this, and again, this is kind of pushing back a little bit culturally where we are. It is important for us to remember as we bring up our kids that we remember that they are a gift and not an inconvenience. Because our culture is trending in the direction that our kids are more of an inconvenience than a gift. How do we know that? First and foremost, abortion. And for those of you who might say, hey, let's not get political. I'm not trying to. Abortion is not a political issue. Abortion is an issue of life. And the vast majority of abortions in our day have nothing to do with the health of anybody. It is all about convenience. It is the self-centeredness of our culture. 
And so there's a reality there that we would come to understand that our culture is pushing, and that's just one example, more and more in that way. You also look uh, at Europe, and you look at the birth rates and all of those kinds of things that you begin the, the sociological studies that the, the, the nations are not even reproducing themselves anymore, and one of the greatest reasons for that is a self-centered selfishness around time and money and life, because I want everything to be about me. And we fail to see that children are a blessing from God. They are a gift, not an inconvenience. And, and let me just say this too, particularly with abortion. I have no doubt in our congregation that there have been those who have gone that path. Can I just say something to you? All of us fall short of the glory of God and all of us have sinned and if it were not for Jesus all of us would remain in our sin but because of what Jesus did when he took our sins up on that cross the scripture literally says that when we confess him as Savior and Lord believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead then our sins are washed away though they were like scarlet and we are white as snow it is the grace of and the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ. And you know what? That shame and that guilt is no more. You are forgiven in Christ if you've confessed him as Savior and Lord. And that's not only good news for those in that situation, but every single one of us, because otherwise our sin remains on us. But because of what Jesus did, we find freedom, we find joy and peace and life and it's all because of what Jesus did nothing because of what we did it's the gospel message the scripture tells us that our kids are not an inconvenience but they're a gift Psalm 127 3 through 5 says this behold children are a heritage from the Lord the fruit of the womb a reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with him. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. And just pulling out some of those words that children are a heritage. They are a generational blessing. That literally as we pass down faith to the next generation and they pass down faith to the next generation and on and on. It is this heritage of faithfulness to God, this heritage of honoring the Lord in our homes, that they are that heritage, that gift from God. The scripture also says, they're the fruit of the womb, not the fruit of the loom. Sorry, I had to say it. Good dad joke right there. Fruit. It just sounds so much like it. Fruit of the womb, right? So what that means, fruit is always in a good connotation unless it's designated in Scripture as something that is bad fruit. It is something that's joyful, something that brings goodness into the home. As a matter of fact, it calls it in that passage a reward and a gift for the toil of life. Now transition our minds. And I know I joke around a lot about, you know, our kids and all that kind of stuff and try to be funny with different comments. But, but literally our kids, when we have the right perspective and focus, they are a gift from God in such a way that when life gets hard, we look into their faces and joy comes into our hearts. The reflection of the image of God that we get to hold in our arms and we get to walk through in the story of life. That they are a reward. And the last thing that it says in that passage, they are arrows, which means they're useful, right? They're important. They're effective for the purposes of God in their lives. It says, blessed is the family. Blessed is the man and his household whose quiver is full of them, which means the more the merrier in the sense of the reward. Right? You see how that pushes back against a culture of convenience and a culture that says it's all about me? They're a gift. To both parents, all in. They are a gift from God. So then we go on in this passage and says this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. So why is this that he single out dads in this moment and says, do not provoke your children to anger? Because dads, it's sometimes what we're really good at. Right? 
He says, don't provoke your children to anger. And that doesn't mean it takes the fun out of parenting. I know that's what it looks like, but that's not what he's saying there. It's that we don't live in such a way that we would provoke our children, that it would cause anger in their hearts. And again, it goes back to that we begin to model this relationship with God the Father. So we're called to love and discipline and instruct them in the same way that he would. And that word provoke, if you kind of dig deep into what that word means, a great word to describe that is exasperate. That we don't exasperate our kids. Now, what does that mean? It means this, that we have expectations for them, but we don't communicate those expectations. And so we get mad all the time and they have no reason to know why. And so what we've done is created bitterness and disdain and frustration in our relationship. And they don't even know why because we have these set of rules and ideas of how life should go in our home. And yet we never communicate those. That is exasperation. And we talk about this sometimes about walking on eggshells. That's what happens in our home. And so we have to get to a place where we don't provoke them to anger, but we raise them up in love in a good way. And we communicate godly expectations. And then in love, we hold them accountable to those. And we discipline and instruct along the way, which we'll get to here in a minute. Colossians 3.21 also says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And that's actually a different word. In the Greek, it's translated the same, but that word kind of means more you don't poke them, right? You don't just keep poking them. You don't set up, and even it's kind of this, in this context of a a race, like you don't set it up so that you're going to win every time, right? Who's fun is it? How fun is it to play basketball with your dad when he wins all the time, right? And so you don't poke them. You don't just continually cause this grief and frustration in them, but instead, again, loving them in the way that God's designed it, teaching them in the way They should go so that they don't become discouraged. So then how do we begin to do this? How do we begin to bring them up in the Lord? How do we raise or parent our kids? There's two words there we're going to home into, and then then kind of three things. One is this, discipline. I'm going to say them both, discipline and instruction. And if I can make the equation, discipline plus instruction equals discipleship. We make disciples at home. So discipline plus instruction equals discipleship. And let me give us a good picture of that because a lot of times we hear the word instruction and we think kind of a classroom setting. Really, instruction is a lot more like an apprentice. Discipleship is a lot more like an apprentice. So here's what that looks like. I remember um, when I was growing up as a kid, we'd go visit my grandparents. And in the back of kind of this two acres that he had in Tulsa, he had this shed out there and would keep different things, lawnmower and all that kind of stuff in it. But he had woodworking tools. I remember we would go back there and he would take my brother and I and we would begin to learn how to make things out of wood, how to cut them out, the saw, how to uh, do all the different shaping and all that kind of stuff. And here's how it would go. He would go out there, tell us the rules, don't touch this, do touch this, don't put your hand there, right? And go over all the instruction piece of it. But then he would cut a piece out. And then he would pull us over and he would put our hands on it and he would show us how to cut a piece out in a safe way. And all of a sudden, he's not only telling us, but he's showing us in life. And that's the picture of discipleship. It's not that as moms and dads, we would just pour over to them and beat them with the Bible. It's that we would live it out in such a way that we would walk with them along the way, making a disciple of our kids as we go. So that's the image. So that word discipline Same root word as discipleship, but here's what the scripture says about discipline, equating this as God treats us. Hebrews 12, 7 through 11, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have an earth, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he, being God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. As we model that relationship with God, we are called to discipline our kids. We're called to lovingly discipline them. And what that means is it's never in anger. We calm down. It's always in love. 
and we explain why we're disciplining them, and then we hold fast to that because otherwise we're doing the greatest disservice to them because we want to show them the way God does that with us to make us more and more like Jesus. So we discipline our kids. By the way, it's often unpleasant. I would say it's always unpleasant if we love our kids. It's not something we want to. You know, the old adage just hurts me more than it does you. It's really true. Because it's not pleasant, because we love them. So we discipline. The second thing there, that word is instruct or train. And it's the same word used in 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. That word in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped complete for every good work. So this training in God's word. How do we train them? We give them the scriptures. Deuteronomy 6 tells us even more about this, and we'll get to that in just a moment, but we would spend time in God's word and teaching them along the way as we do that. We give them God's word for that training and instruction for life. It's the most important thing that we could teach them. And here's the reality. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What does that mean? One, it's proverbial. It doesn't, it's not a promise that everything will turn out right. It's a proverb in its genre, which means it does most of the time. But here's the reality. How does he turn out? When he is old, he will not depart from it. Sometimes, and a lot of times, training in righteousness is a long game. And we want it to be a short one, right? We want to have that faith talk and read God's word and our kids all of a sudden switch and now they're perfect from here on out, right? And it happened in all of our lives that way, right? No, it doesn't. It's a long game. And so we continue to press in and we continue to challenge and we continue to encourage and we continue to discipline and we continue to instruct even after the nights end in tears sometimes, you get up the next morning ready to go again because parenting is not for the faint of heart. We keep pressing in. We keep loving, we keep instructing, and we play the long game, understanding that God and his spirit works in their hearts each time we give them the truth. So here's three quick things with this. Understanding discipline, understanding instruction, how do we do this? First of all is this, be present in their lives. As parents, for us to bring them up in the way they should go, we have to be present in their lives. That means a couple of things. One. It means that we're present in their friendships. We know what's going on. It means we're present in what's going on in their schoolwork and what's happening in their lives. And by the way, this is for grandparents too, to a certain degree that we're present in their lives. So we're present in the struggles that they're walking through. We're we're present in the victories that we have, that they have. We're present in those uh, sporting moments. We're present in every aspect of their lives so that we're using each of those moments to train them, to develop them, to shift their hearts toward God. But we have to be present. The second thing apart that is this, we have to model presence in a digital age. Because in our culture, you can be physically in a room and not be there at all. And so we have to model what that looks like and say no to a lot of things to say yes to the best thing, to be in the moment with them, enjoying the moment and helping them put their phone down, right? Maybe down for good, or at least for a while. Sorry to scare you. Right? But we're the parents, and so we can do that. We have that authority. You have that right. Be present and help them be present. Stay engaged and enjoy the moment. The second thing is this, that we have to be intentional. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit down. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So kind of there's three aspects of that. The first is that you would teach them. So diligent teaching. In our context, I would love to call that a faith talk. So once a week, where it's designed, their intentional time around the scripture, where we're pouring God's word into their lives in a conversation 
right? And it's intentional. It creates the spiritual authority in our home. It's, it's not a moment of, again, the classroom instruction. There is instructing that takes place, but it's a moment of walking through that with them, that we're having those times intentionally set aside every week for conversation around the scripture. Faith talks. So we're teaching them. The second thing is this. We're talking about it, right? It tells us this way in the text. You should talk about them. When you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise, that we're developing rhythms in our home to begin talking about the things that matter about the scriptures. So here's a great suggestion. Recapture the table in your home. Put Whataburger down. And they have those grocery stores. We've rediscovered those. It's amazing. I know in our culture in Dallas, everyone loves to eat out all the time, but have time around the dinner table where you reconnect and devices away, where all of a sudden we get to talk about things that matter and pull out of our kids sometimes what's going on in their lives till it becomes more and more natural. Right, so capture those moments in the rhythms when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, as you're going through life, spending together, time together and talking intentionally about the things God's doing, when you lie down and when you rise. So when you lie down, uh, what we've tried to do in our home is to make a, a strong rhythm that every night, nearly every night, we will lay with our kids and pray with them and talk with them about what's going on in their life for just a few moments. Right, so having that rhythm before they leave, before they get out of the car in school, on school days, that they know they've been prayed over. And we're praying for them in those contexts, that they're walking out, that those rhythms develop, that our lives become spiritually natural and naturally spiritual. As you sit, as you walk by the way. And then the last thing of that Deuteronomy 6 passage, writing them. So obviously we don't use the phylactery boxes that Orthodox Jews use. Um, we're not writing necessarily on the, the fence posts in our house as you can if you want, but we don't do those things. But maybe it's a chalkboard in the kitchen that simply says every, every week you're going to write a new verse. All of us, we're going to read this, we're going to think about it this week, and then that's going to be the focus of our faith talk at the end of the week. But we're, we're ruminating on God's word. We're thinking about it. We're meditating on it as a, as a family. We're instilling the truth. Teach them, talk of them, write them. Be present, be intentional. And the last thing is this, parents, be strong. One thing the Lord tells Joshua over and over again when he walks into the land that God has promised them, into the promised land with the nation following him, taking over the leadership of Moses, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, because the reality is your home will look different than all of the other homes around you. Lord willing, except for those in this room and others who are Christ followers and living that out. But it's gonna look different from the world. And you're gonna have to face that. And so walk, have those conversations, be strong and courageous and don't back down from the things God's called us to do. Joshua, at the very end of his life in chapter 24, verse 15, says, and it's if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the God of your fathers is the region beyond the river, which means you can choose to serve the false gods of Egypt or the gods of the Amorites in the land in whom you dwell now. So the gods that were here in this land, they're false gods as well. You can choose to serve those things. But as for me and my house, we will serve the one true God. We will serve the Lord. Make that claim in your home that what comes into your home will be honoring to God no matter how it comes into your home. The conversations that you have will be honoring to God the way you live your lives will be honoring to God. The example that you set will be honoring to God that when others come into your house, when the neighbor friends or friends from school, that they look and they see your family and it's vastly different in the way that you talk to each other and treat one another and love one another because Christ is in that home and it's transformative. That as for our houses, we would commit to serve the Lord. Why does this matter? Philippians 2, 15 and 16. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world 
holding fast to the word of life. Why does it matter? Because the gospel is at stake in our kids' lives. And the gospel is not only at stake in their individual lives, but our kids, the next generation, are the next leaders of the church, the next pastors of the church, the next life group leaders, the next ones who are going to go to their places of work and shine brightly in their circles of influence, the ones who are going to build houses and live in apartments, who are around those who live in darkness, and they will shine brightly the gospel. It matters because they're the ones who carry the baton forward. It matters because it honors the Lord in a legacy of faithfulness. They are the church of the future. And so the investment of the gospel begins today. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me? Should your head bowed and eyes closed. In just a moment, we're gonna come to a time of response and just to encourage you to respond however God may be impressing on your heart. I just wanna acknowledge the reality that for some there is pain in the room because of prodigal kids. If you want to pray with us, with one of our pastors, we'll be standing up here and would love the opportunity just to pray with you and walk through whatever that may be. It could be something else related to what was in the passage this morning, or it could be something totally different. Just know that we want to help and pray with you through anything that you're going through. Just encourage you to respond however God would lead you. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the encouragement to live in a way in our homes. Father, that brings abundant life in our homes. That brings peace and joy in our homes. God, I pray you'd give all of us strength, husbands, wives, who then become moms and dads and kids. Lord, all of us the strength to live faithfully and watch how you transform our homes into a beautiful place that you've designed for the word to be taught, for lives to be transformed. God, give us courage to walk that way, trusting that you have abundant life for us now and eternal life for us forever. We thank you for that promise. We thank you for your goodness and your ways. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.